So thanks, Ivory. I think what my objective is be to put into context how the macro issues and these activities we've been undertaking nationally and internationally relate right down to the local level and specifically to help firms. And then Ivory and Ryan can come back in and give specific examples of how they are as economic development leaders executing on this in order to um, strengthen the competitiveness and uh, growth opportunities for individual firms within their regional economies. So with that, um, I'll give a little introduction to the Global Cities Initiative, what motivated it, how it relates in the international trends toward individual businesses, and how economic development leaders are taking action in the support firms to make this business case. Um, Global Cities is fundamentally about strengthening the international economic connections and competitiveness of our metropolitan areas or city regions by focusing in on traded sectors and that will produce more sustained growth and higher quality jobs. We're doing that through a series of activities including research on specific drivers of economic competitiveness and how firms can be uh, better positioned to compete internationally. Innovation, which is problem solving with particular places like Kansas City, Des Moines, and uh, an additional 30 plus internationally city regions on solving these problems and, and performing better. And then exchange, which is replicating these ideas and policies and program solutions so that more places can benefit and help their, they help their business community uh, thrive. We started the Global Cities Initiative because of some major international trends that were really impacting locally on firms. One, urbanization. So that was driving the creation of a much broader global middle class and creating demand for business services, goods and products in a supply chain as well as direct to consumers. Globalization, which I'll mention in a little while, but the international economy is inextricably linked now, whether you like free trade agreements or don't like free trade agreements, trade is happening and trade will not diminish. It's just the rules that you're with it, acting within and therefore globalization is another key factor that everyone in the economy, whether it's local, state or national, needs to take into account in their strategies and obviously firms need to do that as well. And finally, massive disruptive technological change that are shifting the way that firms are innovating, are competing and the workforce fits into firm growth. We took a look at more than 30 places internationally and in the United States to capture the characteristics of what makes them competitive. Every place from small scale, like upstate South Carolina, Greenville, to Singapore, to London, and characterized 10 different elements of things that a city and region could do to make themselves more effective in helping their companies and their workforce compete in the international marketplace. We also took a look at what are the key drivers for economic competitiveness and assessed across traded sectors, innovation, workforce talent, infrastructure, and governance. That's the research piece of this and evaluated these different elements and how city regions could act more effectively in order to support this kind of ecosystem for their firms and individual firms, what the implications were. And we learned that there is this old perception of a global city, a standard traditional perception of a New York, Tokyo, Singapore, London. But in reality, any city can be global in its perspective. So it can be a very small community like Metropolitan Greenville Spartanburg, which as I mentioned before, is focused on these issues and is the highest intensity foreign direct investment in the United States to a Stockholm or Brisbane versus Sydney, Columbus versus Chicago. So what we did is then apply this to, um, to a set of local partners and learned from problem solving with them around how they could use this knowledge to be more effective programmatically and again, focused on helping their firms to grow and support the local economy. This is a list of all the places that are executing on global cities, trade and investment strategies through a process. You can see it's very diverse in terms of economies, geographies, uh, governmental makeup uh, in the United States and increasingly international. This represents in the US uh, more than 30% of the entire economy 
they're now acting with some specificity on global strategies. Um, what that entails specifically in this network has been co developing a comprehensive trades plan, which includes exports and foreign direct investments and other elements of infrastructure or advanced industry support, which I mentioned before as key drivers. Also connecting places to global best practices. So Kansas City and Des Moines can learn from counterparts in San Diego or Toronto or Mexico City and implementation through that kind of peer interaction, monitoring and promoting success stories and facilitating specific international relationships where particular city regions can work with other ones where there is a supply chain link, an industry sector clusteral link, uh, some geographic or workforce links that can benefit from working together to be more competitive. And this element of trade is a key part of a more comprehensive international competitive strategy. So we've seen, again, workforce, infrastructure, utilization of foreign talent, um, innovation activities, all contributing toward what is a base of exports and FDI um, as, as implementation actions by city regions, economic development leads, once more in support of their firms and key industry clusters. So quickly, why does all this matter to firms and to localities? Why are we dealing with this at the local level and the metropolitan level? And what are the examples of actions that have been taken that can be expanded upon by Kansas City and Des Moines? First of all, we looked at where jobs are coming from. And really most jobs are not being created now from bringing large uh, firms into attracting large firms for relocation into a community. They're really coming from new establishments, startups, which then the following year are often the biggest losers in jobs, and that, that um, sweet spot, which is expansion of existing firms. That's why it's so important to focus in on these strategies around growth of your existing businesses through international opportunities, because that's where job creation is coming from. That's where great competitiveness is coming from for regions. And the reason for looking internationally in traded sectors is because you create one traded sector job that actually spins off three locally serving jobs. Um, depends a little bit on the industry, but that's the general multiplier effect. And so rather than focus in on, we need a new retail outlet here, we're talking about supporting firms that have the potential to trade outside of their regions and outside of the country. Um, these are lots of different categories of firms. So it's not just about moving goods and products, but it's also in energy and services and other categories of activity that can be traded outside of the local economy. The great thing about these jobs is that they pay higher wages, nearly double on average, and that they're also available and support from the economic developer's perspective, lots of different skills. So 50% of these kinds of jobs actually don't require a four-year degree. Now, realize that we're acting, as I mentioned, in this international economy. And a big statistic that reflects this is that you'll see um, in 2014, we were about 40% of global, global GDP coming from cross-border flows of goods, services, and capital. That shows really clearly how integrated our international economies are. And of course, the standard stat, there's a huge market still growing in the United States, but more than 80, 85%, close to 86% is projected for growth between 2015 and 2020 outside of the United States. And more broadly, this growth is happening in different parts of the world, as reflected in this map, um, to show that the middle class is expanding. So a proportion of the middle class back in 2009 was concentrated in North America and Europe, but by 2030, an enormous percentage of that middle class is going to be located in the Asia Pacific and increasing percentages in South America, Oceania, and even Africa. And that, this is, uh, uh, the slide is complicated because it actually, um, it actually has a, an animation that doesn't come through for the presentation. But this slide shows that where 75% of all global middle class consumption was concentrated in Europe, Japan, and North America back in 2000, it'll only be 15% by the time we get to 2050. So there's a real market imperative at the macro level for focusing on this issue. Then it gets down to the firms when, and I, I suspect that most of the people watching today are from firms. So what does this mean for business, uh, business executives who are making choices about where they put their effort? Well, 
Middle market firms, those firms that generate the most jobs and they're most likely to be expanding in, um, in, in metropolitan economies, actually do better if they are exporting. So you can see that they have higher revenue uh, growth, they add more employees, they project better revenue growth over non-exporting companies in that middle market. It also works for both goods and services. You see that during the heart of the recession, exporting companies were more resilient. They actually grew in revenue by 37%, while non-exporting manufacturing firms decreased in revenue by 7%. And it applies to business services as well, where you have higher sales, higher employment, and actually paying higher wages than non-exporters. So there is a very clear business case for firm success based upon looking internationally. Now, the problem is that we don't do enough of it. And despite five plus years of focus and, and, and conversation about how important this is, we still don't. Um, we don't have enough recurring exporting firms. So a firm that may do a one-off, uh, two thirds of firms are, are recurring exports, one third of the firms are, are not. Um, the other factor is that they're only selling to one market. And it's not a, uh, a, a question of how much. There's often only one sale to a market. A Canadian company identifies you on the internet, makes a, makes a sale, and that counts as an export. So the, um, the work that we did with the National Center for the Middle Market to evaluate how many firms are looking at these issues, how many are participating internationally, shows that we have a real deficit to address. I'll just mention very briefly the flip side of that, which is foreign direct investment. And we see the US is actually capturing less of an increasing market there. That's important to firms because it generates a lot of additional research and development, again, higher wages, connects with knowledge, technology, and networks that help firms to expand internationally. And the point this is that most of these investments in foreign direct investment from FDI are not greenfield, but they're actually mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, equity positions. So the flip side of being global is also you get assets coming in for, from international investors that really help to expand your companies and oftentimes have a, a fe an effect that enables access to international markets. Now, why at the metropolitan level? Well, that's where the economy really works. You've got shared assets and networks, whether it's economic development organizations, supply chain, close by supply chains, the relationship with universities, research centers, the infrastructure that ties everybody together, and most important of all, the workforce functions at a metropolitan region scale. So we really need to focus down on this level for action. The firms are facing, as we learned through the Global Cities work with all of these communities, firms are facing some very consistent challenges. And you might, re, you might see yourselves in this if you're thinking about exporting or you are um, already or exporting and grappling with some of those issues. Firms are unfamiliar with going global and therefore kind of fear it. They lack awareness of these opportunities. They're confused by very fragmented export assistance delivery systems. On, this, on those export promotion and support side, they're more reactive than proactive. So generate a lower pipeline of export ready companies than might be, um, might be possible if they were more specific and targeted and strategic. And tend to, re regional leaders tend to have a disincentive to really invest in this effort because the ability to count and take credit for um, attracting a business and attracting a certain number of jobs is a lot easier to explain and highlight than growing one, two, three, five jobs in a, a firm that exists. Um, so there are some challenges in the system to overcome and we've been focused on through global cities and in these particular markets. Then finally, there are different roles and responsibilities. A lot of people consider trade to be a national question. What's well, true in terms of setting the groundwork and having an international network of commercial and foreign service offices that cannot be replicated by any individual city. Um, but really at the local level is where your economic development assistance programs can integrate all of these supports from across the, the locality and at different levels of federal and state. Um, they also have the direct relationships with the firms. And so they are able to identify firms through regular interaction. They understand what the local strategy is for economic growth, where you have the greatest strengths and clusters. So that's why we're emphasizing metropolitan areas 
the city regions as the leaders on executing around increased exports. And that means all of these different players that have some role in assisting firms to grow and be more global, whether it's the governmental side, but significantly the private sector has taken the primary role through economic development organizations that are public and private, through chambers of commerce, through special organizations, as well as universities and infrastructure. And finally, I'm going to be very brief about this because I think that Kansas City and Des Moines were better positioned to talk about the details of how they're supporting firms. But through Global Cities, we piloted and then refined a particular approach that now the participants and others are following in order to be effective about executing an international business strategy for their regions and, and positioning to assist firms. It was a market assessment that involved very detailed surveys and hundreds of interviews um, with local firms in order to identify what the needs were, how they were already interacting, and what the support system should look like in order to, to assist them better and to focus on particular uh, opportunities by industry cluster or characteristics of the localized local firms and the economic environment. Um, then there was an actual business plan with specific goals, strategies, tactics, and measures to hold people accountable. Um, so each place identified what their unique position would be and then what their firm characteristics were and tailored their activities and new supports or refinement of existing supports to those firms and that local marketplace. Um, then they made operational assignments and commitments, again, to hold everyone accountable for delivering this. This is not a high-level strategy. It is a very tactical implementation-oriented effort and created some policy memos in order to identify what they needed in order to execute beyond what existing resources were. All these different markets focused on different, different specializations. Um, so what their biggest offer was to the international marketplace, but they also focused beyond these specializations on what their individual firms need and came up with a lot of different activities around exports and foreign direct investment how you know, they could integrate it more effectively into mainstream economic development, the kinds of changes to be more customer driven versus oriented toward what service providers want to measure themselves on, Men new mentoring relationships between firms, large and small, assistance with trade missions and supply chain entry in that way, what are the roles of universities, culture change, new grant competitions, insp aspiring um, new potential exporters to think about this, uh, and how do they project their global identity into the international marketplace most effectively? Lots of different examples of functional coordination, industry sector-based coordination, how to tailor support for firms, whether they were new to export versus new to markets, infrastructure investments, like um, connecting port to facility um, through a new road, um, part, l linkages between what higher ed could do for small, medium-sized enterprises, um, uh, campaigns and uh, integrating assistance through uh, an export portal or better case management. Um, many different examples, including place-to-place -place collaborations around particular industry sectors in which there are strengths, and a whole set of issues and opportunities identified to go forward, just depending again on what the local characteristics look like. So. I will stop there and turn it over to the actual practitioners who are implementing these strategies. And I'm happy to take questions about what's happening in other markets after they talk a little bit about what's happening in Des Moines and Kansas City specifically. Thanks.